Welcome to the third of four episodes of the SciLife Lab talk show. My name is Lisa Kirsebom. I'm a science journalist, and I have the pleasure of guiding you through these four programs on some of the very varied and exciting work that SciLife Lab is doing today and will be doing tomorrow. We air every Friday afternoon at the same time, so mark your calendar already now for next week's program focusing on community collaborations. Today, our theme is data-driven life science. And uh, let's start with a short introduction. Data-driven life science, the future of SciLife Lab. But what is it? Experiments generate data, which can be analyzed to address specific hypotheses. But it can also be used and combined with other data into larger and more complex sets of information and generate new discoveries and new scientific models. These can be addressed with new experiments and so on. Researchers in life sciences often collect large amounts of data to answer research questions they are interested in. Often, the exact same data can be used to answer questions posed by other research groups. Perhaps many, many other research questions and many, many other research groups. This means that data analysis, data management and data sharing is now central at each step of the research process. We often illustrate this with a data life cycle. SciLife Lab will put this concept at the absolute centre of its new data-driven life science programme. Planning is the first stage of the research data life cycle. Every research project starts with a research question. Planning is the backbone of each step of a research project. It's equally important to work on data management, that is, how data will be managed during and after a project. A data management plan is therefore essential for all research projects. The second stage, data collection, involves generating new data, creating metadata or reusing data. Sinoph Lab can provide knowledge about data-driven research and assist with finding reusable data. Good metadata ensures data quality and is essential for data reuse. The third stage is storage and analysis. Here, the data is processed, analysed and documented. Accurate documentation is key for future data reuse. SciLife Lab provides support and tools for data analysis. The fourth stage is interpreting and describing the data. This is often done by a group of researchers and data may have to be shared. SciLife Lab provides tools for data sharing, communication and collaboration both within and between research groups. The fifth stage is long-term storage and archiving. Scientific projects need to address data storage and security to avoid data loss and preserve data after the project finishes. According to Swedish law, universities must archive all research data. The sixth stage is publishing and data sharing. Open access publishing and depositing research data in repositories are two excellent ways to share data. Use a trusted data repository, add metadata and choose suitable licenses. Remember that data sharing increases the research impact, follows open access guidelines and permits data reuse. SciLife Lab promotes open science and provides support for data sharing. The last stage is meta-analysis and data reuse. Reuse data may be used for new research, teaching or to verify published data. Data has to follow open science and fair guidelines. In summary, data is the most valuable long-lasting product in research. It is important for the research community to maximise its effect. Today, data sharing and data reuse are central and integrated parts of the data-driven life sciences. I now say welcome to Emma Lundberg, professor at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology and director of the cell profiling facility at SciLife Lab, and to Sebastian Di Lorenzo, bioinformatician and community coordinator for NBIS, the National Bioinformatics Infrastructure Sweden, which is part of SciLife Lab. Um, Emma, tell us briefly about your current work. What are you doing right now? 
Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, interested in spatial proteomics. So my research lies in the nexus of microscopy proteomics and artificial intelligence. And a lot of my work is also focused on the production of the cell atlas as part of the human protein atlas project. So basically we're trying to understand how the human cell is organized, how the molecules are spatially organized in the human cell. Right. And you are in Sweden now, but you've just recently been to the States, right? Yes, I've been, I spent three years as a sabbatical visitors, visitor at Stanford University and also at the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub in San Francisco. Okay. Great experience. Okay, exciting. Sebastian, same question to you. What's your everyday job? I mean, mainly I'm a bioinformatician uh, working on supporting uh, projects with bioinformatics uh, from Uppsala uh, SciLife Lab. Uh, but other than that, as you mentioned, I'm a uh, community coordinator for NBIS, so I plan the strategy for how we interact with the bioinformatics community in Sweden uh, to try to make sure that uh, we can collaborate on meaningful projects and uh, that everybody who needs to have, uh, get help with bioinformatics knows who we are and that we, uh, that option exists. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, won't you explain to us a little bit what data-driven life science means to your work as it currently is? Sebastian, you can start. I mean, in NBIS, we've already uh, been working towards data-driven life science. We've always been data-centric as data analysis is our main job. Um, So for me, it means working reproducibly, using best practices, making sure that the data has high interoperability after we're complete with a project so that it can be reused. Um, this is something that MBIS has strived for for a long time now, and we're really happy that Silof Lab is joining this data-centric view so, because you know, good data makes life easier for bioinformaticians and it leads to better results. Mm. Emma, what about you? Yes, so I'm, I think one of the few people right now that stand with one foot in each side So I'm both representing the data generators, the data producers as part of the Human Protein Atlas, but I'm also analyzing a lot of big data. So I I can see things from both perspectives, but uh, I think it's very important that to think of life science as a big data discipline, because that's what it's becoming or already has become. And uh, we need to think of how to manage these large data sets and how to make them available and how to build the tools to analyze them and how to share them and and distribute them both raw data and analyzed data. So it's, it's a different way of thinking. And we need to incorporate that thinking from end to end in projects. Yeah. Um, develop a little bit on this. What, what does data-driven life science make it possible for you and for others to do? I would say that data-driven life science enables us to address more complex biological questions. Uh, we can generate huge data sets, we can integrate these data sets with other data sets, we can synthesize new new data, and we can explore areas of biology we've never explored before. So I think that it's really, uh, this data-driven life science is underpinning a revolution, I would say, that has the potential to really change both how we understand how the human, how our cells function, how human functions, how disease develops and develop better diagnostics as well. So I, I think it's... Um, it's becoming an essential tool. It's uh, the, it, everything in life science is going to be data driven in a in a while, and we have to change the way we're thinking to adopt to that. Everything. There's no part that's like not going to be based on this anymore, or or not going to be affected by it. I, th- I think everything will be affected by it. We see in the labs, we see automation, and that's a way of data driven data generation. We see. Or uh, new tools being developed for data analysis. We see new portals for da- data dissemination. We see new tools for data visualization. So in a way, I think that the data-driven aspect will affect everything. Yeah. Sebastian, what do you say? What, what is made possible by this? I mean, it's basically an investment in the future, um, uh, which enables so much more research. Uh, this will make it easier to perform good analysis uh, later on, and that can happen pretty rapidly. But once we've accrued a huge amount of data, I mean, it really opens up it's the information we need to make uh, groundbreaking discoveries at a very fast pace, especially when we're using these uh, evolving unsupervised methods uh, on on the new compute infrastructures that are being developed right now, 
uh, this really allows the data to speak for itself. So we're not limited by human imagination uh, anymore for what kind of discoveries we can make. And it doesn't only help unsupervised analysis. We can also, I mean, this data will be useful for, uh, you know, hypothesis-driven analysis as well. Uh, so really it's a win-win and, uh, and it's really uh, fun to see that uh, we're investing in data because I think that'll be, I mean, that's a safe investment for the future. Hmm. It obviously does carry a lot of promise, but what does it take for data-driven life science to, um, to actually deliver on that promise? What do researchers have to do or how do you need to work with it? I mean, you need, from the it's a shared responsibility. As a bioinformatician, you need to be able to perform best practice analyses. You need to be able to deliver the data in a way where it has high interoperability with other data sets. I mean, so you can integrate it into this big data set. Uh, you need to work reproducibly and you need to uh, be able to handle sensitive data and work correctly on these high performance computer clusters. So a lot of the technical skills are required that we need to teach data scientists to get this to work well. Uh, but then, as I said, it's a group project. So we, to make the data fair after it's released is uh, something where the ethical permits and everything have to be in place and it has to be deposited to a good repository. And this is something that NBIS works a lot with. Uh, <clears throat> we have our compute and uh, storage infrastructure uh, within NBIS working on the uh, uh, infrastructure in Sweden. And we have data stewards now that are helping uh, manage uh, the data so that it's being encrypted in a good way all the way through the project. And so that even at the start and planning phase of the project where we like to be involved, people are already thinking about where this is going to end up. And this is moving the goalpost from just uh, researchers thinking about results to a certain degree to thinking about results and data and how this data will be used later on. Mm -hmm. Emma, what do you say? What does it take? Yes, and in addition to what Sebastian said, I agree with all of that. I also think that we have to be better at data storytelling, if you will. So for example, we need to be able to convey uh, data, not just as numbers, but also in a very comprehensible narrative. So I think that's a side that we also have to practice and, and improve. Hmm. Um, what new competencies uh, are needed in this situation? What new skills? Uh, well, I think that I, basically what Sebastian said, I think that every scientist needs to be computationally savvy to some extent. And then we also need interdisciplinary teams where we have data scientists that develop new models and we have people that maintain and uh, set up the infrastructures. And we also have other people that work that are experts in the wet lab. So we need to have interdisciplinary teams everywhere, I would say, and raise the overall computational uh, skills. Mm -hmm. Sebastian, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think Emma said it very well. I mean, uh, the more... I should. I, I mean, basically, one of the biggest things that we will need is people who can perform these. Uh, we need to teach the people to perform these unsupervised, use these unsupervised methods, and be able to work with really big data on, on clusters. And uh, I think that is very achievable. Hmm. Um, finally, would you say something, Sebastian, that you hope for data-driven life science to solve in the future? And if something is necessary to get there that we might not see enough OGA? I hope that it solves um, projects where we haven't had enough data really to uh, perform this, uh, these kind of analyses. And um, uh, where, as I said, we're not limited by human imagination anymore. So uh, issues where humans really couldn't even think of the, uh, the uh, answer and then uh, data comes in and saves us with these great methods. Uh, but more than that, I think, I hope that uh, going forward, this landscape will change where uh, we can use the, um, where we can use old data uh, and convert it into this new data. So it's not just the new data being uh, generated, but it also is the new, old data being reanalyzed and integrated into this. And as uh, projects that have a single primary focus uh, in how they are being analyzed, I hope that they are also going to take the time to fully characterize the data so that it has as high interoperability as possible. Uh, and with that, I think we'll have a great uh, start for solving a lot of problems. Thank you. Emma, what do you dream of data-driven life science solving in the future? 
Well, well, I hope that data-driven life science will, that the knowledge that we will generate will underpin the revolution in healthcare, that we will get better personalized medicine and healthcare for everyone. That would be the dream, I would say. And one, the other question, what is needed? I also think that open science is very important for this. If we want to move rapidly, we have to dare to share the data reagents early on with openly and freely. And just instead of being afraid of being scoped, see that it really brings synergies. Thank you very much. Thank you to Emma and to Sebastian for joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Now, introducing to you Ola Spjut at Uppsala University, who, among other things, is very experienced in AI modeling and deeply involved in data-driven life science. In my research, we study the effect of drugs and uh, we also screen for new drugs and with the, I come from a background in AI and modeling so I've been working on machine learning for 15 years but now we uh, now we study uh, cells in uh, in a cell profiling laboratory and uh, to this end we, we analyze the, the results using high content microscopy and uh, it's shown to be very applicable to AI modeling I think COVID-19 will have an effect on life science in the future. If you compare to, for example, manufacturing, uh, companies are nowadays changing strategic plans to include more, more automation in the future. And I think in life science, uh, this will also be true that people are, will be shifting some uh, efforts towards automation. Uh, and especially, I work in the pharmaceutical industry where automation uh, is, is really hot right now. And I think uh, COVID-19 has a chance will probably affect that as well. Our current research is uh, largely data-driven already today, but uh, my research team tries to take the next step so that uh, we will be able to close the loop between data generation, analysis, and designing the next generation of experiments. Uh, and if we can uh, use automation and artificial intelligence to sort of close this loop, uh, this is what we're striving for to do and applying it to drug discovery projects. The best things about our research is that we get to combine a lot of different competencies. So we, we have competencies in, in biology, chemistry, uh, from our uh, laboratory experiments, and we're combining that with a lot of expertise in big data, automation, data analytics. And I think it's very rewarding to work in such interdisciplinary teams and leading them. Uh, I find that uh, that is great fun. So what am I most proud of? Yeah. We try a lot to make our methods become used by others. And we spend extra time to package them for this. And this has led to one of our methods being implemented in AstraZeneca's drug safety pipeline. Another system that we developed is running clinical practice for profiling drug resistance. Another software tool is run by several of the largest pharmaceutical companies for making predictions with confidence. But I'm also very proud of that we started up as a pure bioinformatics group and then we analyzed other people's data. But we now moved into producing data ourselves and built up an automated self profiling lab for this. It's been very exciting and, and I'm looking forward to how this will develop in the future. Being a part of Scilaf Lab is very important for us. We make a lot of use of the Scilaf Lab facilities, the Chemical Biolo Biology Consortium Sweden, NBIS, the Scilaf Lab Data Center, and the Compute and Storage Facility. All of these are crucial for us to be able to carry out our research. Scilaf Lab courses are also important for my PhD students. Uh, and uh, I think events and gatherings are, are important for meeting other scientists. And I think Scilaf Lab has organized this in a, in a very collaborative way. It's time to talk a little bit about what data-driven life science will mean to Scilaf Lab in the coming years. I welcome to the show again Oli Kaljuniemi, um, director of SciLife Lab. Hi, Oli. 
Hi, Lisa. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Now, on October 20th, the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation announced 12 years of funding, a total of 3.1 billion Swedish crowns to support data-driven life, uh, life science in Sweden. Tell me, what will this mean for SciLife Lab? Well, obviously, this is a, a really uh, major and important program, just the size of it. But uh, it's also uh, significance and fit with the strategy of SciLife Lab is, is just perfect. So there were uh, certain reasons why the uh, Wallenberg Foundation gave this from their angle. It fits with their strategy to promote Sweden and uh, data sciences in Sweden. But it also fits extremely well with the SciLife Lab concept on how we move from infrastructure to research networks and then focus on data. Right. And this ties in very well with things you already had planned in the roadmap, right? Well, this is exactly kind of a uh, uh, based on the roadmap that, that we have a uh, three key components of SciLife Lab, the infrastructure, the research community, and then the data-driven life science. So uh, it's, a, it's a, like a third leg to the SciLife Lab uh, existence and its support base as well. And uh, it, it's also very, very uh, important that it's a national program, that it, it's really uh, promoting the fact that we at SciLife Lab work with the entire life science community to, to promote this, this uh, uh, data-driven life science and, and work together in this program. Right. Uh, so tell me, what will actually happen? How will this change the infrastructure as we know it today? Well, I don't actually think that the infrastructure as such maybe is, is that much influenced directly. I think it's more important what happens after people have used the infrastructure and what happens to the data. So uh, it's just a, a, a major transition in the sense that we pay more attention to the data produced and, and how uh, work with researchers as researchers on how data will be handled, how it will be stored, how it will be analyzed, how it will be mined, how it will be made available, linked to other databases and uh, so forth. So there's just like uh, another step to the services of SciLife Lab in a way. But I would rather say that it's, it's the infrastructure that we have today is also the basis of the future SciLife Lab operation. We just add this emphasis on data on top of mm. it. Okay, so um, what's the next step? What's going to happen now? Well, we are in a very beginning, as, as you said, it was just announced like three weeks ago. And uh, uh, the program officially starts 1st of January. But the first year will really be a very uh, sort of a, uh, uh, a slow start in a way. We want to plan it well. We want to, to, to sort of get everything right. And we will want to have discussions with the whole life science community, including all universities. And the first step is really that we need to have a steering group and we need to uh, kind of make the detailed uh, plans for the uh, program. So uh, this is a nice concept. It's a, it's a lot of money. It's a, it's a trust to us from the Wallenberg, but we need to make it work. We need to put content in it and we need to see how we really get the whole research community with us in this program. What new competencies will you be needing when you start this program up? Well, I, I, I think you, could, you, you refer to competencies where, uh, of scientists uh, of the future because obviously we need a lot of competencies to put the program together. But if we just consider data-driven life science, what is needed to practice data-driven life science? And I think this is actually a key role of the program to, to train and, uh, and educate and, and uh, recruit the next generation of uh, life scientists who are as comfortable with understanding biology as they are about understanding data science. And, and it's this type of a multidisciplinary hybrid uh, education that, 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 that this program is also focusing on and, and which is very much needed in the future. There are always challenges. So tell me, what challenges do you see in moving ahead with this field? 
Well, first of all, I can answer that in a program level. So there is a challenge that this is a national program. We have 10 universities. We have four research fields and, and we, should uh, we should join them into one program. So this is taking some time, I'm sure, before we, we kind of have a fully aligned uh, group of people interested in driving things forward. Uh, so that's clearly one challenge to make such a mega program work. And, and uh, that is really uh, what we need to do next year. But the, uh, the uh, other challenge is really the data-driven life science as well, that this is a fundamental shift in how we practice life science. We've been very experiment-centric in life science. A scientist plans an experiment, carries that out, publishes the data, and moves on. And I think today this is really changing that we are trying to create permanent uh, databases and understanding and uh, opportunities also to do science, life science entirely on a, on a uh, data-driven manner. Uh, some people maybe do it without even a lab laboratory just based on mining data. So, so it is a, a, a major change and, and obviously major changes take time, they take effort. And, and uh, obviously we have 12 years. So this is not a sprint, this is a marathon, but we really want to have a big impact. Right. So finally, what do you hope with this program finally on the road, what do you hope that SciLife Lab will be able to achieve in data-driven life science? Well, I have said this in a, in a way that no little, no less, we want to uh, change how life science is practiced. And that will be the, the simple thing that what we would like to do in the next 12 years. Thank you very much, Oli. Thanks for taking part here today. Thanks so much. Thanks. We have already talked about how important openness is in data-driven life science. And we explore this further in this next film. Generally, for all fields of science, uh, data from publicly funded research should be made open, if possible. Uh, also, from a research ethics perspective, people have a right to know what is known, and it's a fundamental part of the scientific process to share knowledge as widely as possible. Uh, for data-driven life science especially, openness will be required, since uh, data will be the main value and driver of the research and the ability to access and reuse data will be absolutely central. They should publish the data in existing international repositories for research data. An important part of publishing research data for it to be useful for data-driven life science is to make it what we call fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And not only for humans, but for computers as well, which I think is a key aspect to the future success of data-driven life science. The easiest way for a researcher to ensure that the data is fair is to rely on the procedures and community standards that the international repositories have established. So the Sweden dataset is a resource that we have built both for researchers and clinicians. Uh, it consists of genetic variant frequencies for the Swedish population and the whole idea with this project is to make it as available as possible. It's possible also to access the individual genome sequences uh, through a secure system uh, so that everyone can make as much as possible of this data set and reuse it in all possible ways. Yeah, for me personally, this has been a very exciting and fun project. Uh, it has opened up for a lot of collaborations both when building the actual database with the SciLife Lab team, but also with researchers in Sweden, uh, in Europe, in Japan and even Australia. So, uh, so it's been a really great journey for me. So 
So, um, why is open access important for CryoEM is uh, almost a rhetoric question because if you look uh, at, the, um, at the development of the technique in the last five to ten years, it's been really crucial the fact that uh, um, softwares for data processing were made uh, completely open and code accessible. Uh, moreover, more and more protein structures are obtained using CryoEM and they have to be deposited in the PDB, which is in turn part of Elixir, so it's really a big international repository. And it is really convenient as well as absolutely important to have a tracking path to this big uh, depository. And uh, moreover, we can actually imagine that more and more we'll be retrieving data, old data, to mine out even more information with new softwares, with new knowledge, and um, and also they can be used for teaching. So it's it's simply uh, extremely important to have an open access for the development of Kaioya and for the users. And F Core is a community project to collect a curated set of gold standard bioinformatics analysis pipelines built using Nextflow. The project was started at the National Genomics Infrastructure at SciLife Lab and now has over 40 different workflows spanning genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and imaging, with more being added all the time. The NF Core community was really built around this concept of reproducible science. All pipelines are subject to rigorous testing, both automated and through community review. When a pipeline is released, it's given a DOI and both the code and the package software is archived. For every run, analysis metadata is reported and saved with the results. This all means it's easy to exactly reproduce a past analysis with any NFCore pipeline, even if it's been run by a different group. Importantly, all the code is released with an open source MIT license and is available on GitHub. We now have over 42 different institutions listed working with NFCore and over 500 people have contributed on GitHub. We have over a thousand users on Slack. The pipelines themselves have been downloaded over 130,000 times in the past year and the website receives vis visitors from all over the world, so we're a truly global community. I'm extremely proud of how NFCore is contributing to open and reproducible science, and I'm very happy to see how projects such as this, which can start within Scilaf Lab infrastructures, can have an international impact. We are about to talk about data-driven life science importance for Sweden, and I welcome Two new guests, Annika Stensson Trigel, Professor and Vice President of, for Research at KTH Royal Institute of Technology, and Lotta Jungqvist, CEO at Testa Center at Sutiva. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. You are also both members of the SciLife Lab Board, and that needs no further introduction, but I'd like to ask Lotta, would you explain briefly to us what Sutiva is and what Testa Center is? Sure. Testa Center, uh, let's start with Cytiva. So Cytiva is a company that uh, provides consumables and equipment to the biopharma industry and also to uh, researchers in the biopharma field. And Testa Center is a joint effort between the Swedish government and Cytiva to support growth of life science, both to support uh, academic uh, projects and also startup companies that take the first step into industrialization. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's now talk about uh, data-driven life science, or actually let's start with just data-driven science. Annika, what's your experience with this? Well, when I started as a new PhD student for over 30 years ago in a computer-aided design, that was my subject, uh, then we thought that very soon we could use the computer to solve uh, all the problems that was uh, necessary uh, using the computers with our models that we develop very qu quickly. But uh, after all those years, I see that still it's a lot of things that we cannot solve. Uh, but we see that using a lot of data and by finding patterns, analyze, analyzing them, we can see 
uh, a lot of new things that we can gain experience from and that can help us to find solutions on problems that are very, very difficult to describe. So by using this uh, information and use uh, all the new mathematical uh, tools and aids that are developed, we could learn much more and uh, that could help us to find good solutions for tomorrow. Right, so you've really seen this development happen. So um, what's your view on the importance of data-driven life science in Sweden today? Yes, uh, uh, within life science, we have a lot of challenges. It's uh, a lot of um, diseases. Uh, we need to find new drugs and so on. Uh, and there, uh, in order to find solutions to that, we need to use uh, all of these experimental facilities we have uh, and get information out of it. And there, by using the computer tools that could help us to find patterns, we could get much better solutions to that. Mm, right. Lotta, same question to you. How do you see data-driven life science as a field in Sweden today and its importance for the country and, and for the life science companies? I, it's extremely important to have sort of a convergence between two sectors, between the, the data-driven uh, industry and all the new digital tools and the life science uh, industry and also re academic research. The combination of the two uh, will have utmost importance for Sweden as a country. And with this uh, investment we now have from the Valdemar Foundation in both these areas, both sort of the data-driven part and also the life science part, and having them merge together and, and use uh, both these uh, two boxes together, uh, that would be fantastic. How do you see that developing, like in a more hands-on way? Uh, the, we just talked about the, with this uh, with Oli about this about the uh, new program at SciLife Lab. What do you think that will mean uh, for Sweden? Just leveraging all the data and making sure we can mine the data. Data is the new gold. So instead of digging for gold, we're digging for 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 data, and making that data accessible both for the researchers and for the industry uh, will give us both new insights and also new uh, companies, new treatments for diseases, new diagnostic tools. Just sort of the combination of the two uh, will give us a lot of in, uh, sort of output from this investment. Yes. Uh, Annika, um, how do you see uh, this program playing into the development in, in Sweden? What will it mean for, uh, well, for Sweden at large, but also for the research community, of course, at large? Yes. If we look at the research community in Sweden, we are very strong both in digitalization and in life science. Uh, and we have experience of working together with the universities. Uh, but, but with this effort, we can join together. And by building a program, a joint program with these different areas uh, together, uh, we can become much stronger. The, so, for example, from my experience from the WASP Valibar AI Autonomous System and Software Program, there we have built not only recruiting new people to Sweden, uh, a lot of PhD students and so on, but also building a community. So that means that for researchers working at universities all over Sweden to learn to know each other, also learn to know the industry and also learn to know about the problems uh, and thereby getting this uh, community, the context, we can build critical mass. And by building the critical mass in this uh, uh, system where we work together, we will be much more attractive also. So that means that for new researchers, we have seen that we have succeeded to get really excellent researchers to Sweden, for example, in the WASP program, just because this community building, that they are very attractive to come to Sweden for that. And I think that is something that we could really win by having such a program uh, building up now so that we could really join forces together, all of us, to make Sweden much more attractive in this area, both for industry, but also for attracting researchers, the really, really good one to Sweden. Mm. Yes. Uh, so we have a program um, being set up. We have a huge investment. But uh, what does it take to really explore this potential in full. Um, money is good and a program is good, but, but what else? Uh, yes, it's important that we have, for example, PhD uh, school, so that we have that the PhD students that are involved uh, learn uh, the same type of uh, uh, 
uh, knowledge, but also learn to know each other because it's a lot about communication with different people. Uh, by that also, it could be that uh, one research area connecting to another research area since we will have natural places to meet uh, within this program, uh, workshops, seminars, and a lot of these activities. And also by the uh, support that will be developed within the uh, computer science uh, part also will make it easier for us to, uh, by using the developed uh, technologies for a much wider um, type of researchers, I think we could gain much uh, uh, good results together. Lotta, what do you say? What does it take to explore the full potential? I think it's the openness to be able to attract talent, uh, to have sort of smart people working together, uh, and to be able to uh, sort of be open to new tools and do things in a new way. So it's, it's a very good sort of converging these uh, tools and technologies between the two areas. Because uh, I think there's, um, in my background, I said I'm a biologist uh, by training. Um, it's not easy to be able to, to learn and gain from all the new modern digital tools. But together with someone that's skilled in that area, uh, we can take some new steps together. So I think it's to be open to, um, to interacting in new ways with new people and with new tools. How do you see the private sector contributing in this field and being supported by the field and by academia in this? Uh, so these digital tools and, and data-driven uh, both science and, and industry is extremely important for industry. And I would say that many industries are uh, just as good as this as in the academic field. Um, so leveraging the combination of the two will be even more important. And um, what we want to achieve by this is not only to take the steps in academic research, but also to, to make sure that the, the data is accessible for industry so that the industry can make use of it, maybe develop new therapeutics or new diagnostic tools, uh, but also that the, the um, academic researchers get to understand what are the needs in the industry and how can we help and support the industry to grow in this area. Right. A final question, and I ask Lotta first. Um, where do you see data-driven life science having put Sweden as a nation in, let's say, 10 years from now? 10 years from now is such a long time. Um, and uh, I think what's important with this investment, it's a long-term investment, which is good. And I think we, we continuously need to invest in our science, in our talents, in our technology, to be able to be competitive in the global market, uh, both sort of a, in an academic setting, but also in the industry setting. So I think... I think with this and the combination of all the investment that the Wallenberg Foundation has made, uh, we're able to put Sweden on the map as one of the leading innovation countries and also in, in the life science area. Thank you. Annika, where do you see data-driven life science having put us in 10 years? Yeah, I see that we have <coughs> built up the community within the data-driven life science to really have connected uh, the research that are both in the uh, digitalization area with the life science area, really make them work together because it's also very important to really know what are the important questions because we as researchers want to make impact where it really matters. And by uh, working together uh, and also with industry, hopefully we'll get shorter time to results and get impact in society. So that can shorten the time from good ideas to really good use in the society. And I hope that's really what we have succeeded by then. Thank you very much. Thanks, Annika. Thanks, Lotta, for joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you. This was the third show in the SciLife Lab talk show. Uh, join us next week when we will talk about SciLife Lab and community collaborations. Same time. See you then. Mm -hmm.